good. Um, hi, I'm Greg. This is not a talk about a UBPF. <laughs> but the obligatory thing, um, next year I want to do USB on the UBPF. That'll be my talk next year. Seriously. A cool thing, um, if you don't know about, we said, Dave said, talk about BPF. Um, BPF allows the kernel to run user space programs. You can build a user space program as a kernel module and have the kernel loaded and run it as a user space program. We have a microkernel. Nobody noticed. Thanks, Alexi. <laughs> it's actually really cool. I, I, more people should take advantage of that. OK, um, this is going to be like a 40-minute rant with an un, um, unsatisfying conclusion. You've been warned. Um, I don't normally say this, but I am going to say this today. This is just me. I've been working with CVEs since they came out in 1999. This is not the Linux Foundation, the sponsor of the Linux Foundation. This is just me. Um, hopefully, I convince them and everybody else that I'm right. Let's see what happens. So let's talk about CVE. CVE, this comes from the website. There's a link to them. Um, common vulnerability and exposures. People toss this name around a lot. What it really means, this is what they say, and this is a real quote. I do not understand what that quote means. The way to interrupt real and better security coverage. Um, all a CVE is is a tag. It's just an identifier. Um, it's a string that everybody can throw in their security bulletin and feel happy. That's it. They just feel good about it. They track it. They feel happy. It's much better than what we used to have, which was this. Fix something on the second paragraph of this random web page over here that we hope will not go away. And that's the problem we had. We had all these problems of people were fixing bugs, and it was impossible to track them across products, across devices, and different real things. Because we had the problem in 1999 of different libraries embedded different places were buggy. How do we fix them? We fix them. How do people know that there's a fix that people need to have? But really, it was the CGI plugin <laughs> exploits that caused all of this. There's a whole bunch of remote execution vulnerabilities and CV, CGI plugins for Apache, and Apache was bundled inside other products that nobody realized was because it was in there because it didn't have to be told because we licensed of Apache. And all these products were vulnerable. So you had all these problems that were found in these plugins. Nobody realized how to get that information out to everybody else. CV came along, the US government set it up along with some, a whole bunch of other people and said, here's a way to do a tag, and let's track these things. Another good reason for CVEs is Zlib. <laughs> Zlib's everywhere. It's all over the world. It's in every product. Everybody uses it. And it's been buggy for 15 years. Um, that's, I, I'm not going to say more about Zlib. Um, it's a great product, but anyway. So tracking when a fix happens in Zlib that actually gets into the product that you use and rely on, a CVE is good. Because a CVE just looks like this. It's real simple. It's a CV year number. It used to be a four-digit number. Now it's a five-digit number. An amazing number of things broke when they moved from four to five. Life goes on. I think they moved to five in 2019, 18, 17. Anyway, that's all it is. It's a unique number. And it says some information behind it, and that's it. You can look it up online, see what it kind of says. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But it's just a number. But it's a unique number, so that means somebody has to give you this unique number. Somebody has, you can't just make a number up. You have to get it from somebody to make sure it isn't the same as somebody else's. And now there's about 110 different organizations you can go to and ask for a number for. And it's distributed around the world. All the major countries have them. Lots of companies have them. If you want a Linux CVE, the kernel community does not give them out. We actually had to say in the kernel security document, we do not care about them. We do not give them out. You're on your own. You can go and ask Mitra for them. There's web forms to get them from. Uh, Red Hat is one, can get them. Um, Canonical can. All the major Linux distros can do this. Um, it's just a number, but it's a unique number. So CVE is just a number and a tiny description. It turns out you need something else behind that. And that became the NVD. And most people don't realize that this is happening. But there's a national vulnerability database. It has all the CVEs, and it analyzes the CVEs and tries to give it a score. It tries to say, if it's good, bad, what is it? Is it important? Is it not important? And there's tons of arguments about how they give scores, so much so that there's two different ways they give scores. And there's a table that says version 1 or version 5 or something like that, and how they give these scores. And they can differ vastly, depending on what you feel like. But it's a searchable database. Um, it is updated with updates to CVEs happen over time, but it's updated slowly. 
Um, slow to update for overall. I got some stats on that later. Um, but living not in the United States anymore, the word national is interesting. <laughs> what does that mean? This national there means the US, like the World Series, all the worlds of the US, right? Um, there's other countries finally came up with their own idea of this because they didn't like just the US getting in on this. So China made one. There's a China National Vulnerability Database. And here's some stats. The good report came out a couple years ago saying that the China database actually picks them up faster, finds more things, and responds faster than the US one. But the bad thing about the China database is it never gets updated. So an update happens to the CVE, the China database never gets updated to see that. And I'll talk more about updates later. It's a big problem with CVEs. So you have two big major national databases out there, publicly searchable, works great. You can look them up. Looks nice. Everybody's happy, right? So this I cut and pasted from a white paper written by some people. I don't know if the white paper is public yet. Um, it's an interesting white paper about um, how to do security and stuff. But they talk about the problems with CVEs. And there's a whole bunch of different interesting things. Um, I'm only going to go over the bottom ones. Let's work backwards. The top ones are interesting. They're rejected. Um, long time to get them. Poor descriptions. There's really, if you look at the database, it says like Spectra. There is a problem. <laughs> um, the scoring is hilarious. Um, let's work these bottom up. So, run by the government. U.S. government. Um, this is a big problem. It's a big problem for two reasons. One is uh, people don't trust governments, right? And good thing. If it's trusted by this government, some other governments don't trust the U.S. government. All of my friends here working for ANSI, would you report something to the U.S. government if you found a vulnerability? Probably not legally allowed to. I don't know if you are or not, but I would wonder about that. Um, it's funded. The funding is really, really odd. It's funded by the, now by DHS and SISA. Um, but it's really, really underfunded. The budget fluctuates every six months. Um, actually, there were some US senators came out and did a report saying, this is unacceptable. You guys need to fix it. Wrote some big letters. And I couldn't track down whatever happened to that. So I think it's still in a horrible funding limbo. It's very, very underfunded. So the ability for it to work is really not good. Um, also, when you tell and you ask for a CVE, usually the problem isn't public yet. You just want a number so you can put it in your security bulletin when you publish it. So you, don't, you want to have some trust that the people running this thing aren't going to leak, right? Um, during Spectrum Meltdown, there was a US Senate subcommittee hearing on this. Luckily, I didn't have to go. I had to testify on the phone, but I didn't have to go. Um, the person who did go, one question really came up and was uh, somebody from MITRA who works for CVE was asked, why didn't the US government agencies know about this ahead of time? You guys had a CVE assigned, why weren't we told about this? And MITRA and CVE said, no, we don't tell anybody. And the senators were not happy with that. That's not a good thing. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I don't think I trust CVE. I trust those guys are not going to leak. But you have national government agencies saying, "Why aren't we told about this stuff ahead of time?" That should make people worried. Not oh, good. Anyway, that's it for the government. Not going to any more governments. Not going to any more trouble. Um, here's the big one. It's too complex. Thomas, where's Thomas? Spectra. I counted 10 patches. I think it was 40, right? Spectra 1 for the beginning. I don't, it was lost in the noise. We had so much crap flowing around then. Um, I know you talked about that. Um, people like tying a CVE to a single patch. Um, I'll show you an example of where a single patch got three CVEs. Um, <laughs> it's really difficult to say. Um, if you look at the CVE entry for Spectra meltdown, it doesn't say what patches actually fixed it. Not good. Um, we're still fixing Spectra. Gustavo's fixed Spectra for the past three years. <laughs> um, it's still going on. There's another patch just went in two days ago, I think, for it. Um, none of these things are going. So if you think, oh, this CVE reflects this patch, great, I'm secure, I'm done, let's go, it's not true at all. In fact, it's a lie. If you just rely on that, you will be insecure. And also, the NVD part of that doesn't actually point to all the fixes all the time. Sometimes it does, Spectrum Meltdown, it doesn't. If you look at anything complex, 
it just gives up and just says, there was a problem. These guys said they fixed it. Have fun. Not good. Another thing about CVEs work also, I mean, it's closed and open source. So with the open source side, you can point to source code. And sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. It's a, it's a grab bag mix. It's a little weird thing. So that's a big problem. Complex things can't be handled with a single ID like that. This is what I run into all the time. Um, a number of other people in this room run into all the time. We have people who think they're security researchers that want a CVE for the resume. And that's cool. I mean, I got my name on it and things like that. Um, get the pad of resume, say, I found these security problems. But the problem is we're running into more and more and more as really, really stupid things for getting asked for a CVE. And most all these things that are happening are not actually problems. So let's look at some interesting things. Here's a fun number. This happened this year in my code, so I get to blame me for all this stuff. Um, this is what CVE 12379 says, that there's a memory leak. In case, of, in case we're out of memory, we're going to leak some more memory. Think about that. <laughs> um, there's a memory leak up to 5.1.5. That number doesn't make any sense, but it's another question. Um, I'll talk about that. That's what it says. That's all it says. And here's the patch. I dug through. You dig it out. Gen did it. Um, case actually reviewed it. And I agreed, yeah, it kind of looks OK. Problem if we came out like an array. This is at boot time. But instead of just returning memory, we need to free some other things. OK, normal things. You guys are technical. Tell me where the security problem. If we are out of memory, and we're returning that we're out of memory, we might leak a little bit more memory. What's the security problem here? I can't. There isn't one. <laughs> there flat out isn't one. But here's what CVE says. And here's the wonderful timeline. So the date on this patch <laughs> was the 23rd. The 27th, a CVE was published. Public. So it became public. No idea where it came from. It came from Mitra themselves. So somebody went out and applied for it. It doesn't say who. I'm guessing the original developer here. Uh, MVD, a day later, very nicely, said this is a medium security issue. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's actually raising pretty high. Fedora, Red Hat, in their infinite wisdom, actually does really good things. They actually have a requirement that all CVEs must be in the product. Great. That's good. Um, so they grab it, and they stick it in there. Um, and then they realize maybe there isn't a problem. So there's a problem with something else. I'll talk about this more in a minute. And then finally, a month later, somebody says, maybe this wasn't a good idea. And then NetApp, a month later after that, says, or no, not a month, a couple of weeks later, 5.1.3 came out. But I have no idea why 5.1.3 is an issue, because 5.1.3 came out months previous to that. And all this was happening during the 5.3 issue, right? When was this? 5. Uh, 5.3. This was during the 5.3 development series. No idea about 5.1 this year. So here's Ben. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Actually had to do more work to dispute the fact. <laughs> One week after I committed this, because in the email thread with Case and I, Case was like, well, this really doesn't quite unwind this everything. Somebody should just revert this whole thing. It's a mess. Ben actually proved that it really was a mess. Proved that the fix was actually worse than the problem. If I didn't know better, I would think somebody was trying to troll us. But luckily, you can never trip this. You can never, ever, if the kernel cannot allocate 128 bytes of memory, you are dead. I don't think, I think we physically cannot fail that call. Um, so this can never happen. So the fact that somebody tried to make something bad happen, it doesn't, anyway. It's bad. <laughs> So here is the patch history overlaid with the CVE history. Here, tell me some. OK, so original patch sent it on the 21st. Then he sent the version 2 based on case saying what's going on. And he sent version 2 again, which really was version 3 because he changed something. Again, new developer. We talked about that before. Um, patch, I merged it on the 24th because, yeah, it looks like a bug fix into my development tree. Tree that only is in developed, shows up in Linux next, no public use everywhere. Um, case, after I committed, said probably some way should just remove this thing. Um, three days later, a CVE came out. No idea. I was not paying attention. I don't look for these things. A day later, MVD does something saying it's secure, it's, or it's actually medium score. Ben wakes up, sends a revert. I apply the revert. 
Nothing's ever been in any public tree. Nobody's backported a patch. Nothing's been tagged anywhere. Fedora dug it up, put it in their 1.7 kernel. 1.7 is great, but what is this 1.3 number from? Then they realized we then reverted it, like, thankfully, dropped it, disputed it. Somebody spent the time and disputed it. Thank you again, Red Hat. What? Dispute. You disputed it. Thank you. <laughs> it's hard. It's really hard to dispute it, isn't it? I mean, it's a, it's a difficult task. You have to go out of your way. You spent more time on this, I think, than me by far. NetApp came out and said 5.1.3 is, okay, is bad. I have no idea why. And then 5.3 RC1 is finally released with these patches in it. So a whole bunch of stuff happened in a developer tree. Nothing ever hit the public tree. And this was a mess. Um, this is just one example. <laughs> we do this every month, uh, if not every week. Um, this happens all the time. All these people, CVE people, are off running on and scurrying around. Fedora is having to track crazy things. Debian's cra tracking these as well. Debian links don't link back to the things, so I guess Mitre doesn't suck it up. But this happens all the time. This was junk. Total nonsense. Even if this was real, the score of a medium was nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. This was not a real issue. Disputing these issues is bad. Somebody was trying to pad a resume. If you look, system developers continue to do this. Watch out. It, ah, there's a lot of patches. The problem is distros and companies have a rule. All CVE patches must be added to their tree. Fedora did that, sucked it in. It was wrong. Um, Chrome OS is another tool, uh, distro. They have a requirement. They suck everything in. Um, so they're asking me to backport patches at times for stable patches that are been disputed and been rejected. They don't have a way to tell a lot of times if something is real or not, because I'm not going to take the time and refute and dispute it. It takes time to do that. Um, it's a big problem. We're getting junk patches merged into trees because some external database that we don't control says that it should be. Not good at all. OK. This was written, written in the white paper. This is abuse by engineers. Circumvent. All right, now this is why I have a disclaimer. This is what's really happening. <laughs> Some companies, for their enterprise kernels, have a hard time getting patches added. Oh, don't take a picture of this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, it's recorded, yeah. Um, this is actually true. This is what is happening. Um, some companies have a requirement that if you get a patch into their enterprise kernels, it has to be there for a reason. Engineers come up and say, oh, I found a bug fix. It needs to be backported because somebody did something. I can't justify it. I'll get a CVE. And does it. And we have the proof that this is happening. Watch this. So we case cooked at all the numbers from 2016 to the middle of 2018. 1,000 CVEs were signed. The average is a negative fixed state. The average is we ask for a CD CVE days, months, years after it's been fixed. The average fixed state is negative 100 days. The longest one is 10 years. I want to know about that one. Somebody said, oh, wow, I really got to backport this to, like, what, SLES 4? <laughs> I do not know what happens. SUSE does do this at times. SUSE is actually a lot better than Red Hat. They're a little more flexible. But somebody did something for 10 years old. There's actually one out there that took us that we haven't really fixed yet, I think. <laughs> Um, but the numbers are all over the place. The standard deviation for these numbers is over a year. That means people are abusing these to try and work around management problems. I don't blame the engineers for doing this. I would do the same thing if I were them. Create CVEs out of nowhere, just go away. This is happening today. Um, the updated numbers case said he'd do them. I haven't seen them yet. Um, but it hasn't gotten better. In fact, I think it's gotten worse. The average fix date is getting longer in the past. <laughs> that shows that these things really don't matter. They don't tell you anything, right? So this is what the kernel does today. I'm putting into the stable trees about 22 patches a day. That's 5%. That's actually pretty low. 5% is low. The numbers that Sasha and other people have run about says we should be running 10 to 15%. We should be higher. Um, he's ramping up the tools to make us there. That scares people. These are bug fixes that are in Linus's tree. They shouldn't scare people. These are things. Um, I release them one to two times a week, depending on my travels. I already did one 
one this week, maybe not. Um, the best thing is these are fully tested as a unified release, and I give them to you for free. So I've had, sat in companies when they, uh, somebody says, 22 a day, I can't keep up with that. Just tell me which ones I need. I'm like, I don't know which ones you need. Take them all. Oh, I can't take them all. Like, take them all. Why? It takes too much work. I'm like, I'm giving it to them for free. Take them all. And take them all because of this. I'm fixing a known security problem once a week. I know there's a security issue in there once a week. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I know what they are. Because they look like any other bug fix. I'm also fixing things that really are security fixes that nobody realizes. And that happens all the time. The Linux kernel security team, we fix things, we move on, and we keep on going. A bug is a bug is a bug. We're not going to take the time and effort to figure out what was a bug, what was a security issue or not. Infamously, again, I'll blame me, in the TTY layer, I wrote some code a long time ago. I fixed it later, a couple years later. Three years go by, Red Hat says, oh, look, I'm getting a CVE for this three-year-old bug fix you did. Because it turns out you can root the box. I wrote the original code. I wrote the bug fix. I had no idea it was a security issue. They got a negative date on their CVE. <laughs> they were happy. They backported it. Turns out RHEL, whatever it was, was vulnerable for three years to this problem. Anybody that actually had updated and taken a new kernel was not vulnerable. And that's the thing. You have to take these updates. You have to take them all. Because again, 1,000 CVEs over a decade, very, very few CVEs are actually being assigned. They're getting more because more people are paying attention to it. And I have people come up with these graphs at the conference and say, why are there so many CVEs? I'm like, because people want resumes. Um, but very, very few happen. Again, kernel fixes do not equal a CVE. Um, best product CVEs don't say anything about follow-on fixes. We've had Spectre Meltdown fixes, Meltdown especially, or other Spectre issues, fix this week, fix next week, fix the week after that. Fix a month after that. Never ever modified. If you only cherry pick them, this company say, I'll just cherry pick it. You have an insecure system. And I got proof of this in a minute. I'll show you. I actually have numbers. So I've said this in the past. You're not using for it. You are running an insecure system. Since this is a friendly crowd that nobody's going to take a picture of this, I will say this. And I have the numbers to prove it. Look at what Red Hat's doing today. They know that they have to cherry pick things that were done a year ago, a year in the future, a year ago to their old kernel. Uh, I can't think which way it goes what. They're having to grab random pieces, grab a CVE, and backport the hell out of it. If they had only updated the whole thing to all the LTS releases, they would be secure. It's that simple. You want to know how to break a red hat box? Look at the tree. You want to know how to do any of these other ones? Look at this tree. You want to know how to break your phone? So I've audited lots of phone trees. Um, I'm not going to say what company this is. Uh, I think you can figure it out by reading the slides. Very popular phone. Came out in March. It shipped with the 41485 kernel. At that time, it only added 3 million lines of code. What can go wrong there? Um, they're only running 3.9 million. It's really weird. Um, anyway, so I compared it. I did this audit in May. So it was obviously going to be a little bit behind. But the phone was in May. It was shipping. It was in my hand. I actually was using it. I'm still using it. I'm not going to use it anymore um, because I looked, and they still haven't fixed their kernel. Um, so they grabbed some. They cherry picked some random patches, some F2FS thermal logging cleanups. This is the best. Why were they caring about print case? And maybe a certain chips fix to their fixes. <laughs> They swore that they were only taking all the things that they had to have. They looked through them all. They read the logs. And years ago, like two years ago at this conference, I proved that nobody reads the logs and crashed everything with a patch that Thomas wrote that said, here's the problem. Here's the, actually how you exploit it. And here's the fix. Nobody ever caught that. These guys mixed 12 documented CVEs in the change log itself. It said CVE something. We rarely have them. They were documented. In the networking stack, you can remotely crash the phone on a Wi-Fi network. A uh, hid, horrible hid problems we've had over the years. With thanks to fuzzing, we're finally fixing them all. And here's all the things they really, really missed. Um, the best one is their spin locks aren't working right now. They don't realize it. Um, 
I'm going to wait to see what happens there. Um, all those fixes that they missed, all those things that actually affect them. The best thing, um, worrying about people like, there's so many changes, I don't care about them all, I just want the ones that affect me. Um, the Google Pixel phone has a script that when they do a merge from an LTS tree, they actually go through, and in the change log, they show you, in the merge change point, they show you what patches actually apply based on their build configuration. They test that. And there's only usually a handful, because out of those 22 patches that happen a day, only a handful actually are in the stuff you actually run. There, they can see what they, and they audit those, they look at them all, they say, is there a problem or not? That's the best way to do it. The script is free, it's done every week, go do that. These guys were not doing that at all. And I'll talk about Google again. The Google security team last year did this work for me, or for other people, they gave it to me. They tracked every single thing that they told the developers that they, they have a big tool that they call Vomit that searches the web and grabs anything related to a security issue and shoves it in there and says, go fix this. Every single thing that they found and told the security team to fix or that was reported to them other places was already fixed in the LTS kernel. Every single thing. The only thing that wasn't fixed out of those, what, 17 patches was due to out of tree code or a feature that was backported incorrectly. Everything was fixed before they knew it. Because of this, Google is now requiring Android devices, if they're certified, to take LTS kernels at a, some cycle. I'll take six months. <laughs> Three months would be nice. Um, I will call out Sony, and I'll call out Essential. Those guys update their kernels every two months. It's the latest LTS kernel. They've been doing it for over a year, maybe two years now. They do a really, really good job. Those two phones, I can really say, are very good. Um, Pixel is getting better. Pixel ones are doing, I think they're lagging about four or five months, but at least they're there. Um, hopefully, with a new Pixel comes out, they'll, they'll do something else as well. So this is a real problem. These are the devices that Linux runs on. 2.5 billion instances of Linux are Android phones. The cloud supercomputers is a drop in the bucket. It's a rounding error for these devices. This is where Linux is the most, and this is where the security matters the most. If they grab the LTS fixes, they grab all those things, it will actually be a secure device. That's why Google's doing this, and I really, really am happy about it. So, sad talk, sorry. <laughs> so, CVEs are broken. They don't work for us, right? How do we fix them? We can do a bunch of different things. We can ignore them. I like this. We're doing this today. <laughs> well, not really, because some people do care about them. Some people do this. I say we should just ignore them. Great. Um, Thomas and I and a few other people sat down with some people from CV and Mitra and came up with an idea. And this was floated by the other people. And they said, we know. We know it's a problem. We know this doesn't work. Burn this to the ground. Ask for those 22 Ask for a CVE for every single patch you have to the kernel. Um, I got approval, and I got somebody to say that they would fund it if I wanted to do it. It would be a fun, it would be a horrible intern's job for six months. They go crazy, they hate me. Um, it's a horrible ta task to fill out these things that actually ask for CVE. Um, no, it, it, maybe, but we know it's broken. Let's not just try and abuse the system. It might be fun to watch Red Hat scramble. But I'm not going to do that. So we're engineers. We like building things. Let's make something new, right? We can do this. We know how to solve this problem. We have, since 1999, we got a prior art. Let's figure this out. What do we need to do? What are the requirements? First off, it has to be a unique identifier. Works great. Distributed. We've proven that asking for a, C, a number from another person doesn't really work. They've gotten better. There's 100 different people, uh, places you can ask now. It needs to be distributed somehow, right? we able to revise it over time. We should search it. It should be public. All good things. These things are things. Revised over time is important. We need to have this. So let's look at a patch that we do. This is a patch that Ben did, the revert one. So it says we revert this commit, and it fixes that commit ID. We say revert. We're doing these things. These commit IDs are up there. Commit ID 15B3. This reverts commit 84UC. And Mitra and CVE actually references these. They say, hey, look, and they're pointing to my testing tree, which is hilarious. Testing doesn't, can be rebased. 
that was bad. <laughs> Nobody ever rely on testing tree. Um, they point to these Git IDs. Luckily, they stayed the same. Um, these are the Git IDs. So Mitra's already using Git IDs. Wonderful. Git IDs are cool. So here's another one. This is great. One patch, three CVEs. If you look at the patch, it's like fix, fix, fix. In the kernel development community, we require patches to be broken up into unique pieces. One logical piece per fix. We are, I don't want to curse. We are obsessed about this. We have to make you want, break it down to the tiniest possible piece. This was acceptable to Linux kernel community as one logical change to the kernel, yet three different CVEs. <laughs> ah, okay, I'm not going to talk. <laughs> Uh, you can get a lot by CVE people. Anyway, this is a commit. It went into 419, I think, or 53, I think. Um, commit ID 5C or 7C, whatever. And when I backport this to the 419 kernel, I always put in the commit ID. Commit 7CA. So you can track these things. We track these things around. Yes. Um, where's Maybe. I, I'm not disagreeing uh, with you. Uh, for example, in, in some, some old kernel versions, only two of those, one of them, uh, and two. So I backported this way back. They all applied. <laughs> so anyway, that is a good reason. That, that could be a valid reason for this. Um, the CV, I doubt Mitra actually asked for that. I think this person went and, I know this person went and asked for three individual ones. They sent it to us as three, actually, individual bug reports. Even, is that the given wallet? The uh, email address doesn't seem to be valid to me. <laughs> is it yeah. what? Sorry? Is the mail address in the ACK even valid? Yeah. Doesn't seem to be. Gmail.com? Like com G at the end. <laughs> oh, yeah, that one. That's true. Yeah. So I do, with Jonathan, a lot of statistics on kernel stats. Everybody spells their name wrong. Everybody types their email address wrong. That's an email address typo. Um, make it a macro. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, I didn't apply this thing. Um, so there's a patch. So, but again, commit IDs. We track them around the world. Um, we even have scripts. There's a link to my script. I say, what? After I backport this stuff, fix and what release, give it the ID. And it says, wait, Greg backported it to 4.4, 4.19, all those different releases. And also showed up in the 5.3 release. We have these tools. We use these tools every single day. We track this stuff. Here's another fun patch from Jan. Jan's one of those people, if you ever see a patch from him in the kernel, look out. Um, floppy driver. <laughs> Turns out we were copying data the wrong way in the floppy driver. Nobody noticed for 20 years. <laughs> well, no, actually, no, not 20 years. Actually, it was only a couple years. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, he fixed this. But he says fixes, he fixed this commit. So we can track that 2.9b. We can see where, how far back we need to track this stuff. And then when we backport it to 4.19, it has a commit of where it fixes and the commit ID that. And if I say, where was that original 2.2.9? And I said it really showed up in 4. It was really showed up first in 4.13, but I backported to 4.9.187, 4.4.187. So I've got to backport the other one to all those different ones. So we are doing this today. So. We've been doing this for 14 years. Why doesn't everybody notice? Because nobody knows what we've been doing. It comes down to that. So how do you solve the problem when nobody knows what you're doing? You don't get a lawyer. You get the second worst thing. Um, I know some nice marketing people. Um, actually, marketing matters. Marketing, that's all CVEs are. It's marketing and showing us, telling a story about what is happening and how it's being tracked around the world and how to fix it. So we need a good name for this. Git commit ID doesn't work really well. Let's come up with some cool names. Linux git kernel ID, LKG, LGI, I can't even do that one. Um, what's the next one? Linux kernel ID, all right, LKI. 
Eh, not bad. Um, Linux commit ID, because I don't want Linux kernel really is a redundancy because Linux is a kernel. I don't want to argue with the GNU people. Um, <laughs> Linux commit ID. Yeah, okay. How about kernel git ID? That's getting better, but it really is a Linux thing, maybe. I don't know, but we want to do other people to do this. So git kernel ID. <laughs> because but there's other kernels out there, and we want other people to use the same thing because they use git, so it isn't a kernel thing. And how about this one? <laughs> <laughs> But I do not have that kind of an ego. <laughs> Get hash ID. Eh, we're getting better. But what have I been calling it all this time? What have we been calling it for 14 years? It's really just a change ID. We've been calling it this, or a commit ID. This is a unique identifier that is worldwide, hopefully unique because there won't be any collisions. It works today. This is what we have. Let's use it. Let's talk about it. It's a CID, 12-digit hex number. Easiest thing to search for. I wrote up, I bashed together a horrible shell script in about a few minutes and said, pull all the CIDs from this old kernel release. Boom. Those are all the fixes that were upstream that were already in that release. Those are all things that should be backported because they all fix something. They're always a fix. Sometimes we had a new ID. Um, I don't even see one in this one. This one's from 4.19 to 4.19.1, so I think it was just stuff Dave sent me for networking ahead of time. Ah, here's another, here's another Spectre. <laughs> Again, we're fixing Spectre things constantly. Um, take them all. Here's the IDs. Put them in databases. Track them around the world if you want. We have these. You can clone them. They're there. Let's just use these today. So how do we fix them? I suggest we just do two things. We ignore them, <laughs> and we rebrand what we've been doing. We need to tell people how to do this. I talked to other software projects, Kubernetes, um, other cloud stuff that use Git. They're like, yeah, that makes total sense. Why don't we do that? Let's just unify this. Backport the thing you want. Use the Git ID. You can track it. You can write your own scripts. I mean, it's a tiny little red gex for it. Use what we have today. The change ID. Just do that. That's it. That's my whole rant. Thank you. Uh, yeah, let's do what we're doing today. Hi. I have a question. <laughs> and you may not like it. You have, we do not create CVEs for your stuff. <laughs> yes. But we can. We can track it with these. Because you track these. Yes, they are. Uh, yeah. So, uh, hashes. Yeah. But I have a different question. So, <clears throat> you're saying that you're issuing stable releases, which are fully tested as unified release. So, yes. just take them and use them. Yes. And then on the next slide, you're saying that if you're using um, 4.1485 instead of 108, you're missing a whole lot of fixes for networking, MM, yeah. and spin locks are not working. So the question is, how was the 85 release tested? And if I'm upgrading to 4, 8, 108, what guarantees that I have the spin lock fixed, but mutex is broken? <laughs> so uh, we've talked about why there are so many bug fixes going in the kernel. It's because there's more people using it. There's more people testing code paths than ever happened. Um, we do have a problem of lots of bugs. We are trying to fix them as fast as possible. Our goal is, and we get this wrong occasionally, not to ever regress in these stable patches. Every once in a while we do. I think our average, our average today is 0.01%. It will happen, but I rely on testing. So Google tests the heck out of these things. Lots of other people test the heck out of these things. Lonaro has huge test frameworks, working with kernel CI to make better test frameworks. Test your device. I'll take a six-month delay to get to your device because you have to go through testing. Test it. Whatever you would have done for that original kernel that you blessed and thought was good enough. Just test it and make sure we didn't break anything. Again, 0.01% of the time, we might fail, but we're human. Most always, we have a very, very good track record. We have a track record of the past 15 years. You can see our track record. We have the history to show that we don't regress in stable trees. 
except on a very, very tiny thing because we're humans. But, but you have the spin lock broken in the state of the the release. The so the so no, no, the spin lock was broken in the original release. The spin lock was broken in the original release, and nobody caught it. This, the spin lock was broken for years. Yeah. And somebody tripped over it because we have a we noticed that there's stuff just spinning and not making progress. So it got fixed upstream, and, but, but of course you want to have it back for it. And it was just an event once out of in the blue moon. So it, it made eventually progress when the interrupt came in. But it's a problem which needs to be backported, and you don't want to have that problem on your phone. No, and that actually problem when you have when you ship five million phones every couple months, it was actually shown up. I did see it. For most of the Cisco fixes, I've not seen any tests. Uh, so how do we ensure that it doesn't regress? Um, I I don't know. That's how do we test? <laughs> we run the Cisco and make sure we test. We have functional tests, so we have a lot of tests. We have more tests now than we ever have. I'm not saying we have enough. We need to have more. I, that's like, I mean, that's apple pie. I mean, that's. I would simply respond that uh, by upgrading, you are taking 0.1% chance of hitting a regression. And by not upgrading, you are taking 100% chance of keeping 1,000, and I don't remember how many unknown bugs. Yes, that's the other good point. That's the other way. It's, it's what, do you want to? Be known vulnerable to all these issues that everybody knows about, and I can break, break your machine easily because it's public. Or do you want to take the chance of a zero zero one or zero one percent chance that one of those patches was wrong? What's your odds? I'll take the I'll take the second. If you want to take the other one, fine. I can crash your machine. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned that uh, everyone following the CVEs, uh, I mean, lots of them got broken when they get, got to five digits. Are you planning to break everyone when you get to 13 digits? 12 digits is enough for everybody, right? Um, we're, sli we're finally seeing six digit um, hash um, collisions today. We're finally seeing that. Um, how big, and we've been going for what, 12, 14 years in one repo. Um, do the exponential out to how long it'll take for 12, right? Um, there could be one, but okay, great. You pick two patches. One from 20 years ago, one from today, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. But, uh, what, what do you want, 14? That, that was meant to be a joke. I know it was meant to be a joke. But that's, I mean, that's what actually the kernel community is standardized on, because we did our best guess. <laughs> Hi, thanks for, for the talk. Um, do you and how do you uh, handle embargoed issues? because the, the change ID is stable once it's committed in Linux tree. So, so what, uh, how do you refer to an issue internally, uh, an embargoed issue, issue, if it's not yet committed in <laughs> Linux tree? Pick a name. Oh yeah, or is there a cool one? So a recent networking fixes happened um, that were developed outside the tree, developers got them done, and actually, Thomas has been doing this for me as well with the um, Spectre Meltdown stuff. You commit it to your local repo. Now you have a stable Git ID. You send that bundle through email to Linus, to David, to me. We suck it in that way. And you, that keeps the same ID. And we've done that already. So if you really worry about that, you can do it that way. And we've actually been doing this for two years. So we have history doing it. OK, thanks. Uh, you mentioned that the, the way to stay safe is to always be running the latest uh, stable or LTS. Um, and then you also mentioned that you do a pretty good job at backporting these, but you're at 10% and you think you should be at 15% of hashes. Or 5%, yeah. If you're at 5 you should be yeah. high. Okay. Um, and, and there's also this whole issue of a lot of bug fixes aren't really marked as being security fixes, uh, kind of obfuscated messages sometimes intentionally that some people otherwise uh, other times people just don't realize it's security related and so, so sometimes you might think well maybe just running mainline kernel is actually most secure because at least it's getting fixes I would but not love it. but on the other hand there's so much just new crazy code that's committed to mainline and it takes a little bit for 
bugs surface, people to start looking at it. What, what, how do you how do you place your judgment on if it's better to be a little bit old but have stuff missed, or be super bleeding edge but have stuff not tested yet? So I get this question asked a lot, especially with the LTS, because like you're going to maintain 4.4 for six years, they're going to maintain them, it's going to be crazy and do it for 20 years. Um, hopefully not them, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, why don't I just stick on 4.4 for, for, for forever? And the reason is because there are things we miss. We know we miss things. And there's also other things is newer kernels have more advanced security features. They have better, they have better ways of protecting a whole class of the bugs from even happening. So you want to use those features. But how much bleeding edge do you want to do? If you use a kernel within a year, I'm happy. Just switch to that. Then we'll, then we'll argue, OK? Nuances. But if you just do a year old kernel, that would be a major change in this industry today. And it, also, newer kernels go faster. Facebook has documented they run mainly on internal network. And they're getting performance increases every release. So if your data center has real power and real things, you might want to do main kernel. That's another big reason. You want those new things. So there's an issue that also comes up when you go back to like 4.4 or whatever. You take a look at a particular bug and you see how important it is to fix. And you also then look up what is the pain threshold for the backport and how much risk do you have of adding a regression by doing the backport in the first place. And that ratio is exponentially down as you go back from release to release. So that's another yeah, and we also have a very well documented. Um, some people from one big company wanted some networking fixes done for 4.9 and 4.4 that were in the main one that didn't go easily. They backported them, and they backported them wrong. And we, I think I just finally took another fix for them today. They at least have tests, so they can test them. <laughs> but yeah, newer kernels work better that way, I would say, the newer ones. So, but if you could just do a year, that would radically change the industry, and then we can argue about months, OK? <laughs> All right, I'm going to be obnoxious. For yes. Me. I'm good at that. Um, I'm curious where the 0.01% regression rate number comes from. I, I have a little script I ran a while back and found that about 2% of the commits in the stable tree have a fixes tag referring to a previous commit yes. added to the same stable tree. So I concluded about a 2% regression rate. So this came from the Chrome OS people who were, I guess it was a noticeable regression, but not a logical regression. So this is this is the numbers from them. So they, they did it, and they have this really cool dashboard that they when they roll out new stable kernels and they can see what fails and what doesn't. So that they gave me that number. But you're right. We do fix fixes. And I have scripts that pull and say what have we fixed the fixes in there and make sure that happens. Um, since I know I'm one of the guilty people of fixing my own fixes, um, a lot of times though the fix actually fixes something and then I, what later on I find out oh there's actually another bug with that same what the fix although it, it didn't the fix I did fixed it fixed the bug but yet it missed another bug so I'm like okay I'm fixing my fix which really wasn't it didn't add a regression it just didn't solve the entire problem so that's it, what I mean yeah. SYZ bot is a, a perfect example of that it fuzzes up to one point crashes boom we fix that bug and then this thing felt bad. Oh, we now crash again. And we're going deeper. And we go deeper. And I'm go actually deeper. sending a commit right now that I <laughs> Fix is a fix. Uh, make sure you tag it. Sorry, I wanted to ask about, like, when you said you're doing a stable release, um, you're not going to mention the security issues because yes. a bug is a bug is a bug is a bug. Yes. I wonder, though, if, if, if there isn't a difference between, like, Fixing a hardware, fixing a hardware bug, and uh, fixing a security issue, which was caused by well, something which could be interesting to research, so we could avoid it in the future. So, um, so this is a policy decision, and I have given a whole talk here on why the kernel security team has this policy. I wrote a whole white paper on it. I can point you to it, and it was a really fun thread, fun thread with Linus and some security people about why we do this. Um, I'll send it to you. But there's a reason why we do it this way. And I gave, again, I gave a whole talk here a couple years ago about that. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. So I'm both recording and asking this question. Uh, I already know the answer, but what's your suggestion for the like poor souls that are stuck on SOC vendor-only kernels that 
<laughs> can't be updated to something else, like e not even LTS or uh, forget the main line. In so this is a real problem. Uh, SOC kernels do add 3 million lines of code, and you're running 3.5 million lines of code. It's a Linux-like device. Um, it's a real problem. And the only way to solve that is to force the vendors to get stuff upstream and to write it in your contract. So the best thing we've been able to do so far working with Google, Google's gotten me into the door of all these vendors, and they know it's a problem, and they know they need to do it. They're like, but our customers don't seem to care. So you, as a customer, if you make these devices, have to push back. Sony, in their contracts, has started putting that in there. Stuff has to be upstream. Stuff has to do this stuff. They realize this is how we solved, years and years ago, the problem of out-of-tree binary Linux kernel drivers for SCSI and for Ethernet. It came down to the hardware vendors who built the motherboards, had to put in their contract that the, dri that the driver had to be upstream first. It had to be open source. The only way we can solve this technological problem is with lawyers. <laughs> um, that being said, I beat on these companies all the time. MediaTek's doing good. MediaTek's getting a lot of stuff upstream. Qualcomm's upstreaming their two-year-old device today. <laughs> but I it's am, getting there. IMX? It, pardon me? IMX? I don't know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so other companies, are, it, there's, it depends on the vendor. Some vendors are really good. Renaissance, I'll say, is really good. Yeah, yeah. They, they do this stuff and they know it right because it saves them money. So if a company has lots of money to burn, like Qualcomm, they're willing to be out of tree. So yes, Renaissance is the one. So uh, you mentioned that, uh, in your opinion, Google is doing really good now, uh, including uh, Chrome OS. But then, uh, so they upstream pretty much everything for the hardware. But still, there are products uh, that have already been released. They never update anything. While the mainline support is there, well, supposedly there. So, what's your opinion there? Should they update the mm -hmm. latest? LTS? If they can, yes. Yeah, so if they can update, they should. And you can. And so I took a vendor SOC tree from a major Taiwanese company, I won't name, and they said, ah, it's impossible to drag it forward. I did it in a week. Um, it can be done. It is not impossible by any means. Um, you just have to do the work. Nobody wants to do the work because nobody's willing to pay for the work. So that's it. Uh, so so we actually do these boards based on AmLogic, and we've been doing, like sponsoring the upstream for it, and it's been sort of quite the exploratory experience, um, like sort of working with the vendor, working with consultancies, and it, the vendors really just like uh, like don't really care about upstream, right? So I take your I take like stable, and then I merge every two weeks, and then build a kernel, and then release an image, but um, but the Android stuff, right? Specifically, the Google TV stuff. They they work on two year old kernels that haven't been patched for two years. So, and then they release it to vendors. I mean, like people who make boards. And then those people, you know, build Android TV with DRM in it. And then DRM is one of the things that like drives me crazy, because because you know once that key is signed and the image is signed. That, that thing won't get updated for three years, and that's an OTT box sitting in somebody's house for... I agree, it's a problem. And they're yeah. slowly, so the Android phone ecosystem is finally starting to be fixed. Yeah. Spreading that to the auto and TV and other parts of Google is the next step. Um, I visited one of those vendors that makes Android TVs, and I was like, hey, cool, I have that, I just bought that TV. And the engineers say, never put it connected to the network. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> so don't connect your device to network and all that. Um, but that defeats the purpose of your smart TV, so then you use your little Chrome. But anyway, um, it's a problem. It's a real problem. It's a known problem. Um, it has to be enforced, and Google's starting to actually enforce it. That's the only way to solve the problem, is to cause some pain. DRM, DRM I'm not going to go there. <laughs> you two find it out. <laughs> Thank you. Could we imagine uh, some uh, um, accepting contributions under a slightly derivative license where uh, the developer would say uh, it is illegal to run, to, to ship my code uh, if it's missing uh, fixes or if it's being it's too old or whatever, so that <laughs> we can at least scare, it violates, it violates the license. scare a little bit uh, the people no, no, who ship no. too old. Code. So, uh, and this is actually a topic that comes up now. Um, licenses, copyright licenses cannot dictate ethics. Okay. They cannot dictate ethics. That's what they're not meant for. Laws dictate ethics, not copyright licenses. 
So saying, dictating use, specific use of your code based on a license, actually, GPL3 violated that. But we'll argue about that later. Um, <laughs> that's, yeah, I know. Yeah. But um, that's, you shouldn't dictate use. So again, laser wielding sharks running Linux. Yes. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> it's not open source. It's not free software. So I just wanted to answer the IMX question, which was there. Um, the older IMXs, uh, they are fully mainline, and you should run mainline on that or LPS, just like Q said. Um, the newer ones are getting there. Um, <clears throat> and if you run the vendor kernel, it's a disaster. It's like 6,000 patches on top of, <laughs> uh, of dubious quality on top of like ancient, ancient kernel version. It's just don't use that ever. It's I mean, we've been, bad. we've been doing this for, everybody's been doing this for 20 years. We know how to do it right. Finally, we're dictating penalties if you do it wrong. And that's, again, people with lawyers can do that. Which is nice to see, finally. Because security matters. And this is the only way to get things secure. All right, I think I ran out. Am I out of time? OK, last one. Yeah, this would break a bunch of MITRE rules, so it's more a joke than a suggestion. But have you tried, um, have you considered getting a throwaway kernel CNA just to issue the single <laughs> official issued, uh, the single officially issued kernel CV and then just continually update it with all the CIDs. <laughs> That's down into the burn it down. <laughs> <laughs> it might be fun. I mean, it's, it's hacking. I'm not going to be mean here. I, these people have their own problems and other things to deal with. I'm not going to be. If I was younger, I'd say yes. <laughs> Somebody else who's young and ambitious, please do that. Um, kernel community is not a C, uh, CNA. I don't want to be a CNA. Um, turns out Linux Foundation is now a CNA, thanks to Zephyr. Um, but they do not issue Linux, issue Linux CVs. So it's only for Zephyr. So anyway, all right. Thanks a lot.